Amy Goss, and um, as, as he said, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Um, really excited to be here to present my research. Not as excited as Dave Feldman. <laughs> Jeff told me to say that. It wasn't my idea. Um, no, but yeah, so today I'm here to talk about some um, research that we've completed in our department and then upcoming research we're going to have coming out looking at carbohydrate restriction in different chronic metabolic disease states, one of those being non alcoholic fatty liver disease in kids. Um, so I thought I would start out, let me make sure I'm advancing these correctly, talking a little bit about how I ended up in the research space of looking at different types of carbohydrate restricted diets. So when I was a graduate student um, uh, in a PhD program, I started, I developed expertise in imaging and image analysis. So I became very interested in looking at fat distribution patterns and ectopic lipid deposition using MRI for imaging. Um, I always like to show these images from some of our study participants because I think it demonstrates so nicely the difference in different types of obesity phenotypes. And I know we've talked a lot about that over the past couple of days, what it looks like to have metabolically healthy obesity, um, ectopic lipid deposition, and how that affects chronic metabolic disease risk. Um, but what you can see here um, are two Im cross-sectional images of the abdomen. The subcutaneous fat is highlighted in green. The visceral fat um, is highlighted in blue. The individual on the top um, has a BMI around 35, um, a large degree of subcutaneous adipose tissue. The individual below um, has very little um, subcutaneous adipose tissue, and it's all around the organs within that abdominal cavity. But what's interesting about these two people, they have the same BMI, perhaps a very similar waist circumference, right? But what's different is the location of their body fat. And by looking at the image, we can assume the person at the top maintains relatively high levels of glucose tolerance, whereas the individual below um, uh, has impaired glucose tolerance, insulin resistance. Um, so. It's just, I love showing these images because it, it just shows like the dichotomy there of those two different fat distribution phenotypes. Similarly, those are images of the thigh, cross-sectional image of the mid-thigh. One participant on the top has a very healthy looking muscle, very little fat infiltration. The image below, what you see is a lot of that intra, um, intramuscular adipose tissue infiltration. Um, putting this individual at risk of a number of things. In aging adults, they can, it, they can be at risk of metabolic disease, they can be at risk of functional impairment if there's a lot of fat infiltration in the muscle. So identifying these different fat depots and how it's linked to chronic disease is, is very important. Um, so when I was a graduate student, my mentor at the time, um, and still is a mentor of mine, Dr. Barbara Gower, who is also at UAV, she had two funded R01s um, doing controlled feeding studies in two different populations. Um, one was a, they were both eucaloric, so weight maintaining diets, where we were specifically manipulating the glycemic load and the carbohydrate and fat content of these diets. So, in one of these controlled feeding studies, we recruited 69 healthy, overweight, and obese men and women um, to, in a parallel arm randomized clinical trial where they were randomized to low glycemic versus high glycemic low diet, and then another study in women with PCOS that was a crossover intervention, but again, we used the exact same dietary strategy to compare the high glycemic to a low glycemic low diet. And there you can see the breakdown of the macronutrients on these diets that we were testing. Um, it wasn't very low carb by any stretch of the imagination. It was 41% carb on our low glycemic diet. Um, protein was held constant on both diets, and then fat was higher on the low glycemic diet um, compared to our high glycemic diet. Again, these were controlled feeding studies. So the metabolic kitchen at UAB provided all of the food, weighed it out to have them be weight maintaining. We used indirect calorimetry to determine the energy requirements of our participants so we could keep them in energy balance. Um, then in response to these eight-week diets, we measured things like body composition using a DEXA, 
fat distribution using MRI and CT imaging, um, and then we looked at beta cell function insulin sensitivity in lipids. So during this time, I was training to become an image analyst, um, looking, you know, learning about MRI and MR physics, and um, I analyzed all of the images from both of these studies. And what we found was a very interesting that with the reduced carbohydrate low glycemic diet in the absence of weight loss, we got selective depletion of visceral adipose tissue. So in all the participants combined, there was about 11% decrease in their visceral fat. If we look by sex, um, you can see this was particularly profound among the women consuming the low glycemic low diet. Um, interesting, right? So where'd the fat go? They were in weight maintenance. Um, so then, in the study where we looked in women with PCOS, we got similar findings. Again, this was a weight maintenance study design, and what we got was selective depletion of visceral fat and also that intermuscular fat um, that I showed on that previous image. So we, we measured both with MRI imaging. Again, the participants lost a tiny bit of weight, not, not a lot. We, we, in our controlled feeding studies, we tend to consider maintaining your weight within five pounds of your baseline weight to be weight maintenance, and our participants did that, yet we still saw these improvements in body composition and body fat distribution in the absence of significant weight loss. So after we completed these studies, you know, these weren't very low carbohydrate diets, right? They were low glycemic, about 40% carb. We began to ask questions about, well, why are we observing these findings? Um, I didn't show the data, but we also saw improvements in beta cell function and insulin sensitivity in the absence of weight loss. So we began to wonder what happens if we reduce the carbohydrates even more and increase the fat even more compared to a standard diet, low-fat diet. Um, it was around this time, I was a postdoc, I was fortunate enough to get to go spend a week at Eric Westman's clinic observing his patients doing low-carb ketogenic diets. Um, and it was kind of, that was at the beginning of when we started to think more and more about, you know, will we see more benefit from lower carb diets and really started to ask lots of different questions surrounding this ectopic lipid question, the fat distribution question, and then also the metabolic health. How does it affect insulin sensitivity of the liver and the skeletal muscle? How does it affect um, beta cell function in the absence of weight loss, right? Because a lot of the low carb studies that have been done you, it's very difficult to tease apart the effects of weight loss compared to the macronutrient distribution of the diet. So that is sort of what we have set out to try to do in a lot of our study, studies that are currently ongoing. And then this is how I ended up looking at fatty liver in kids. Um, so what's interesting about fatty liver in kids is um, it's, it's really very prevalent. I would say it's been reported that 40% of kids with obesity also have fatty liver, and I would suspect that number is a, a low estimate, that it's actually much higher because it goes undiagnosed. Um, a lot of times kids have persistently elevated liver enzymes, however they never get diagnosed because um, physicians actually don't have a treatment to directly reverse fatty liver in kids. Um, so still the, the principal existing therapies is their lifestyle interventions. Um, and the lifestyle interventions rarely work clinically in kids. If we're just, and I'll talk in a minute about what the current guidelines are in terms of what kids should be eating that have fatty liver. Um, but what are the major contributing factors to fatty liver in kids? Uh, so, it's thought that it's a high glycemic diet with lots of added sugar, um, causing an insulin excur exaggerated insulin secretion and excursion following meals, which is then stimulating de novo lipogenesis. And with de novo lipogenesis in the liver, it is actually manufacturing a relatively small amount of lipid from that process. But when it is upregulated, fat oxidation is being suppressed. So when the liver is seeing both endogenous free fatty acids and fatty acids from the diet and the DNL, it's sort of the perfect storm for liver fat deposition. And really what we're considering liver fat is anything measured on an MRI that's over 5% um, lipid present. So, okay, so the current guidelines that are now, are currently being recommended by AHA, it's really a balanced diet. Um, 
high in whole grains, high in fruits and vegetables, um, low in saturated fat, um, all these, you know, what, what we normally see with like the USDA type guidelines for a healthy quote unquote diet. Um, Again, what we see clinically is that a lot of times this approach does not work in kids. So what we have are physicians and hepatologists were, were, you know, turning to bariatric surgery and, you know, different methods that potentially have long-term um, negative side effects. So that leads me to our specific aims of this study, which were to look at whether a weight-maintaining carbohydrate-restricted diet compared to the standard reduced fat approach that's recommended by ADA could reverse or induce reversal of fatty liver in kids. So our first aim was to look at changes in hepatic lipid content by MRI, and then our second aim was to look at um, secondary outcomes, including insulin resistance, um, blood pressure, body composition, and inflammation in lipids. So our study design, it was a parallel study design with two arms in a randomized clinical trial, and this was a pretty short intervention, it was only eight weeks. Um, participants were recruited from an electronic medical record search at Children's Hospital of Alabama, which is um, the largest children's hospital in our state, it's directly across the street from our nutrition science department, so we have pretty easy access to lots of patients over there. Um, and when I started doing this study, we did an initial medical record search just to get a list of names of kids that have been diagnosed, and we end up with a list of thousands and thousands and thousands of kids, lots of them. Um, so in this study, we had two phases. It was a pilot study, so it wasn't NIH level funding, it was funded by the Thrasher Pediatric Research Fund and also the UAB Diabetes Research Center that's NIH funded. So we had a modified controlled feeding study where I provided groceries to the families for two weeks at the beginning of the study um, that aligned with whichever diet approach they were randomized to, and then there was a six-week free living phase after that initial feeding period. Uh, we recruited 24 boys and girls um, that had been diagnosed with NAFLD with a BMI um, over the 85th percentile. The age was 9 to, nine to 17. Um, they had elevated liver enzymes at baseline, and then they, we confirmed fatty liver via ultrasound. So these are the diets that we, that we prescribed these kids. And, and I didn't mention this earlier, but this was a family-based intervention. So, um, I'm a strong believer that any disease is a family disease, right? If a child's diagnosed with fatty liver, they have to have the support of the entire family to be able to make the appropriate lifestyle changes and appropriate changes to the diet um, to be able to succeed at reversing their liver fat. So we did require a parent to attend all sessions that they had with the registered dietitian. We provided food for the entire family for two weeks at the beginning of the study. Um, our carbohydrate-restricted diet was around 25% carb. Um, we wanted the kids to stick to between 60 grams and 90 grams per day. Um, the fat-restricted diet was 55% um, carb um, and 20% fat. We tried to keep the protein constant on both diets so we could really just look at the carb and fat content. Um, and then um, the families did meet with a registered dietitian on a weekly basis to check in to see if they were able to you know, make sure they're following it um, for some education, for some diet education things. So, um, so it's good. Okay, so this is our primary outcome. Like I said, I do, I'm, I love imaging. We use MRI to look at liver fat. We use both imaging and spectroscopy. Um, on a 3T Prisma, Prisma magnet, and we have liver lab software that really nicely analyzes the MRS data automatically for us and puts out a lovely report um, that I have an example of it here showing um, the liver fat content. So we look at body composition using DEXA um, to assess total and abdominal adiposity and then also look at total lean mass. Um, we did a fasting blood draw to measure changes in liver enzymes, insulin glucose, insulin resistance, and CRP, and then we did a lipid panel as well. So here are the um, demographic data of the kids that we recruited for this study. Um, and what you can see here is that we had primarily Caucasian American kids that enrolled in the study, um, a good balance between male and female participants, um, their age was on average around 14, 15 years old. 
and um, all, all of them had fatty liver disease of the, above that 5% threshold. And then I, I added on fasting insulin because I thought I might get some questions about well, what was their insulin resistance, what was their insulin at baseline. And they did have high fasting insulin. So these are our results after eight weeks. Um, again, I'll remind you that we designed this to be weight maintaining. So we did measure their energy expenditure using indirect calorimetry and then prescribed a weight maintaining diet calorie level. However, our low carb um, diet group did end up losing a significant amount of body weight. Um, they lost, here you're looking at the graph of loss of total adipose tissue, mass, and then also um, loss of abdominal fat. So we do see significant differences between the two groups and loss of fat. There was a tiny decrease in lean mass, um, and that is a very small, it was not significant, um, so it was very, very tiny decrease. And here's the liver fat data. So, and this we published in Pediatric Obesity back in 2020, but we did see that our carbohydrate-restricted diet group had about a 33% loss of their baseline liver fat, which we were very excited about. <laughs> And I always like to show a waterfall plot just to look at the individual responses. There's a lot of information that can be lost if we're just looking at averages of change, but this are, these are the individual patient responses to the two different diets. And what you can see here is that overwhelmingly the kids in the carbohydrate-restricted diet group had the best outcomes when it came to changes in their liver fat. Okay, and here are some of the secondary outcomes. We have insulin resistance, um, significantly better with the carbohydrate-restricted diet group. It even got worse in the low-fat group. Um, blood pressure improved, and also their CRP reflecting some markers of inflammation. Okay, so what did, our, what did they actually eat, right? So this wasn't a tightly controlled feeding study. We did feed them the first two weeks, but then the other six weeks, they were kind of left to their own devices, right? So I think the groups actually adhered relatively well to what we were prescribing them. Um, so this is the breakdown. We asked the kids to fill out a three-day food record at the midpoint of the study so we could get a good idea of what they were actually eating. And what you can see here is that our, our carbohydrate-restricted diet group, they were eating on average around 112 grams of carbohydrate per day um, compared to 211 grams in our higher-carb, low-fat group. Um, they did increase their fat intake, um, percent calories from fat. Um, so they did, you know, they hit some of those percentages that we asked them to, even though they did energy restrict to a greater degree in the carbohydrate-restricted diet group, but only by 100 calories per day, so not a lot um, based on this data. But what's really interesting, too, if you look at these multiple linear regression models that I have here, um, we have a very nice linear relationship between loss of liver fat and percent carbohydrate intake. Um, so in these graphs, I combined all the participants. Um, I did not separa separate them out by diet group. So regardless of their diet assignment, the lower the percent energy intake from carbohydrate, the more fat they lost. And the opposite of that at the bottom, the higher fat intake, um, percent calories from fat intake, also um, was significantly related to loss of liver fat. Okay, so if we break this down a little bit more, looking at different components of the carbohydrates they were eating, we did not find any significant relationship between intake of fructose or sucrose and change in liver fat. It was solely being driven by percent energy from carbohydrates. And that was a, that's the same graph at the bottom there that I have on the previous slide. And if we look at the different components of fat, dietary fat, there's a nice linear relationship between higher intake of both saturated fat and mono um, and MUFAs and loss of liver fat. We do not see a significant relationship between PUFAs and change in liver fat. Okay, so just to conclude this pilot study, and I'm, I'll wrap it up here, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about ongoing studies we have going on that I think can provide some hope that we're going to have some really cool data coming out in the next three to five years from some of these randomized controlled feeding studies looking at carbohydrate restriction in different types of metabolic disease. So um, in conclusion from this study, 
Uh, we found that carbohydrate restricted diet approach in kids is markedly beneficial, improving liver fat, body composition, insulin resistance, um, and inflammation um, in, in kids with NAFLD. Um, and this is in the absence of intentional caloric restriction. So we use this study that I just showed you to apply for a larger NIH grant that we got about two years ago, um, where we're aiming to do a six-month intervention in 80 families, and we're going to feed them all of their food, try to make it as tightly controlled as possible. We're going to be doing, using imaging to looking at change in the hepatic lipid content. We're doing um, euglycemic hyperinsulinemic clamps with um, stable isotope glu glucose tracers to sort of tease apart if depletion of, of um, hepatic lipid results in an increase in hepatic insulin sensitivity. And then also kind of tease apart whether changes in skeletal muscle insulin, insulin sensitivity um, versus the hepatic insulin sensitivity in response to our diets. Um, we also have been funded recently to do a controlled feeding study in adults with type 2 diabetes, where we're feeding a low carbohydrate diet compared to a standard high, um, high carb diet, uh, looking at depletion of pancreatic lipid and whether that's associated with the beta cells springing back to life and improvement in beta cell function. Uh, we also recently got funded by the Department of Defense to do a low carb diet and multiple sclerosis. Um, and this is going to be a six month feeding study where we're going to be looking at ectopic lipid with MRI and then MS-related outcomes as well. Um, also, I thought I, I was talking with someone last night about this other study that I added to the slide last minute where we, um, I'm working with an investigator, Laura Nally at Yale University. She's been funded by the NIH to do a ketogenic diet controlled feeding study in type 1 diabetes, which we, it's really exciting. She's in the midst of recruitment for that study as well. So, I think the good news and the hopefulness about this is that um, the NIH and the DOD are funding these studies, right? That we can sort of start looking at these carbohydrate restricted diets in these different populations. Um, so I think in, on the horizon, we're going to have a lot more really good um, data from rigorous trials to support the use of a carbohydrate restricted diet for metabolic disease. And with that, I'm going to put up my acknowledgement slide. Um, I always say presenting the data is easy. Doing the, the work is hard. <laughs> and this is my research team um, that I work with at UAB. Um, my collaborators on all of these different grants um, are research coordinators and, and registered dietitians who help us pull off all of this stuff. Um, so I just want to put that up to acknowledge them. And um, it's been a pleasure speaking with you all today.